Before 1806, German-speaking people were divided into more than 300 separate states. Many of them smaller than Los Angeles. These states were all members of the Holy Roman Empire, which, during the Middle Ages, attempted to unify Christian Europe under one ruler. By the end of the 18th century, the loose-knit empire had become insignificant. The largest and most important German states were Catholic Austria, whose hereditary dukes had for centuries held the title of Holy Roman Emperor, and Protestant Prussia, a rising military power. Almost all the German states were ruled as absolute monarchies. Power lay entirely with the upper-class landowning families and with the king, whose word was law. There were no constitutions. Peasants were serfs. There was little industry and almost no middle class. In Western Europe, more democratic ideas had taken hold. In Great Britain, parliamentary government, with limitations on the power of kings, had long been established. And by the beginning of the 19th century, an industrial revolution was turning Britain into a modern state. In France, the middle and lower classes rose in 1789 to topple first the aristocracy, and then the monarchy. The French Revolution began with the promise of liberty, equality, and fraternity for all. Serfdom was abolished. Government was to be based on reason. Power was to reside with representatives of the people. But these ideals were subverted during a period of bloody terror, out of which emerged the dictatorship of Napoleon Bonaparte. His army swept across Europe, and in 1806 put an end to the Holy Roman Empire. Napoleon reduced the 300 separate German states to 40. Under him, they became the Confederation of the Rhine. Napoleon also brought with him some of the ideas of the French Revolution, ideas of national feeling, a more liberal social order. The abolition of serfdom and limitations on the power of kings. Some small German states welcomed these reforms and hailed Napoleon as a liberator. But some of the most profound German thinkers and writers of the time called for resistance to Napoleon and rejected the ideals of the French Revolution as the path to true human freedom. Goethe, Germany's foremost literary figure, believed that freedom and morality could come only from the individual, and not through reforming or overthrowing the government. Poet and dramatist Friedrich Schiller thought that education and moral training were more important than political acts. You cannot write a constitution for citizens. You must create citizens for a constitution. The idea that freedom and morality must be developed within the individual was the central theme of German Romanticism, which began around this time. These paintings by Caspar David Friedrich, the leading artist of the period, and this music, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, express the romantic idea that truth is what we experience through our senses, rather than what we achieve through logic or reason. These artists and thinkers opposed the cruelty and backwardness of much of German life, but they did not believe in changing the system or in spreading political power more widely. In this respect, Germany and Western Europe at the beginning of the 19th century were very far apart. Napoleon was finally defeated in 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo by a coalition that included Austria. Meanwhile, in Vienna, once the residence of the Holy Roman Emperors and now the capital of the Emperors of Austria, 
Europe's statesmen gathered to try to restore Europe to what it had been before Napoleon. Actually, no one at the Congress of Vienna wanted a return to 300 German states, but few wanted a united Germany. Austria favored a greater Germany that included the entire Austrian Empire, even though most of its people were not German. Russia wanted a little Germany, restricted to ethnic Germans and excluding Austria. In a little Germany, Prussia, already militarily formidable, would become the dominant German power. The solution at the Congress of Vienna was a new German confederation that included the German-speaking areas of Austria and Prussia. From 1815 to the 1840s, the German Confederation was dominated by the conservative Austrian foreign minister, Prince von Metternich. Metternich believed that order could be maintained best by a strong and absolute monarchy, as represented by his own emperor, Francis I. He bitterly opposed both liberalism and nationalism, the two main political currents of the time. Liberals, inspired by the French Revolution, wanted to curtail royal power. They wanted constitutional government, with elected assemblies and government ministers responsible to those assemblies. Nationalists wanted a united German nation. Metternich saw this as a special threat because it might encourage other national groups within the Austrian Empire to seek nationhood for themselves. There were also small groups of radical Republicans, many of them students, who hoped to get rid of kings altogether and set up a German Republic much like the United States. Toward each group, Metternich's policy was repression. Press and education were controlled, public meetings were forbidden, and political agitators were jailed. In 1830, a series of unsuccessful revolutions swept across Europe, including Germany, providing Metternich with an excuse for even more repression. But Metternich could not wipe out the opposition. Liberals and nationalists, most of them from an expanding middle class, were increasingly joining forces and campaigning for a united Germany based on Prussia. During the 1830s and 1840s, Prussia's economic growth began to tip the balance of power within the German Confederation in her favor. This growth was largely due to a new customs union, the Zollverein, that Prussian finance minister Friedrich von Motz had created among the North German states, with Austria excluded. New roads were built, commerce was expanded, and middle-class fortunes were made as goods flowed freely among the participating states. Moreover, the Zollverein served as a practical model for the little Germany that Prussia wanted. In 1848, liberal and national ideals helped foster a series of revolutions throughout Europe. Members of the middle classes, who demanded a greater say in government and greater economic freedom, led the movements. But workers, students, and peasants formed the bulk of the revolutionary forces. In February, barricades went up in Paris, and King Louis-Philippe was overthrown. Other European monarchs trembled. All over Europe, it seemed that the call for constitutions, for basic human rights, elected assemblies, and the abolition of aristocratic privilege could no longer be resisted. Revolution reached the German states in March. Everywhere, royal ministers were turned out of office and replaced by governments of liberals. In 1789, Germans had turned their backs on the French Revolution, now they eagerly followed the French example. Politically, Germany was closer to Western Europe than at any other time in its history. The first German government to fall was Austria's. 
Street fighting led by university students swept Metternich from office. To save his throne, Emperor Ferdinand appointed liberal ministers and promised a constitution. In Prussia, crowds besieged the palace, and the king, Friedrich Wilhelm IV, rode out among his people promising to support their demands. He pledged a constitution and a united Germany, but under his rule. The new liberal governments quickly elected representatives to a national assembly of all the German states. It met at Frankfurt in May. The aim of the Frankfurt Parliament was to create a constitution for a united German nation. Most of the changes won in the 1848 revolutions endured less than a year. All over Europe, kings and their armies regained control and turned liberal ministries out of office, often using brutal and destructive methods. In Germany, the middle class leaders of the 1848 revolutions contributed to their own downfall. Frightened by the revolutionary demands of workers, peasants, and students, and wanting to protect their own positions and property, they turned on the lower classes. Furthermore, the German liberal leadership never challenged the monarchy, assuming it could be reformed. In the end, monarchy crushed them. Even after the revolutions had been crushed, the Frankfurt Parliament continued to sit. Striving to create a united Germany, the task was hopeless. There was no German national state to which they could attach a constitution. In addition, representatives could not agree among themselves on the boundaries of such a state. Finally, representatives from the parliament invited Friedrich Wilhelm of Prussia to become emperor of Little Germany. But he refused to pick up a crown from the gutter, a dog collar with which they will chain me to 1848. The liberal and national revolutions were temporarily at an end. The next 15 years saw an increasingly bitter struggle between Prussia and Austria for control in Germany, but it was a struggle in which Prussian economic strength offered a decisive advantage. Emancipation of the serfs during the 1848 revolutions led large numbers of peasants to migrate to the cities. Here they provided the cheap labor necessary for industrial growth. The Zollverein had already created a prosperous Prussian middle class. These capitalists now invested their money in building railroads, in heavy industry such as the armaments factories of Friedrich Krupp. And in the rapidly growing chemical industry, where Prussian scientists were beginning to lead the world, a hundred years after the Industrial Revolution had begun in England, Germany was beginning her own headlong plunge into the modern age. It was financed by a powerful class of industrialists, free from the controls imposed in a parliamentary democracy. In its relations with other European states, Prussia was gaining the upper hand over Austria, whose affairs were often poorly managed by Metternich's successors. Austria's refusal to support Russia in the Crimean War in 1854 alienated Tsar Nicholas I, long a faithful supporter of Austrian conservatism. In 1859 and 1860, the Italian War of Unification cost Austria its Italian territories and made an enemy of France, whose ruler Napoleon III had supported the Italian cause. Within Germany itself, Austria sought to maintain the status quo, but there was mounting pressure for a Little Germany solution to unification. There was also a sharp upsurge of national feeling, which, in the absence of a German nation, found its deepest and strongest expression in German culture. German folk tales and legends, such as those collected by the brothers Grimm, served as a basis for a common culture. Jakob Grimm wrote, "After all, what have we in common apart from our language and literature?" The operas of Richard Wagner, whose Tristan and Isolde we are now hearing, 
were staged in grandiose style in the castles of Prussian nobles. These operas glorified German legend and history, especially the rise of Prussia. At the same time, a new and more naturalistic style of painting incorporated modern as well as patriotic themes. In 1861, Wilhelm I, riding the white horse, became the new king of Prussia. At first, he encouraged liberal ideas of national unity. Then he grew frightened of liberal demands. In 1862, he appointed a new chief minister to quell the liberals and strengthen the army. The new minister was Otto von Bismarck, an extreme conservative from an old Prussian landowning family, and a diplomat whose career had blossomed. Said Bismarck, "The great questions of the day will be decided not by speeches and resolutions of majorities. That was the mistake of 1848 and 1849, but by blood and iron." Bismarck was to serve as Prussian Chancellor until 1890. During 28 years at the helm, he maintained strict conservative rule within Prussia. But his adventurous foreign policy brought about what the liberals had failed to achieve: German unity. Bismarck's first application of blood and iron. Came in 1864 in a quarrel with Denmark. At issue were the duchies of Schleswig-Holstein, which Denmark owned, but which contained a large German population. Prussia and Austria briefly joined forces to defeat the Danes, but they quarrelled over who would take possession of the duchies. For the next two years, Bismarck exploited this issue. Using all his diplomatic tricks to goad Austria into a war that would finally settle the question of whether German unity would take place under Austrian or Prussian control. The war came in 1866, and the Prussian army, strengthened by Bismarck, crushed Austria's forces within six weeks. Bismarck's peace terms were generous. Nevertheless, Prussia took Schleswig-Holstein. And organized the North German states into a new confederation. All South German states, except Austria, were free to join. Bismarck's aim to unify a little Germany was almost realized. Meanwhile, in Prussia, Bismarck's military successes allowed him to outmaneuver his opponents. Amid royal pomp and national enthusiasm, liberals could see that German unity was attainable. Political freedom and real parliamentary government would have to wait another fifty years. Elsewhere in Europe, Prussia's growing military and diplomatic strength were causing alarm and threatening the delicate balance of power established at the Congress of Vienna. Napoleon III of France was especially worried. A member of the Prussian royal family, it appeared, might succeed to the Spanish throne. France could then be threatened by Prussian power on its southern as well as its eastern frontier. Bismarck deliberately provoked the French emperor into declaring war by altering a diplomatic message, the Ems telegram. The Franco-Prussian War of 1870 ended in complete victory for Prussia, toppling another Napoleon from his throne, and allowing Prussia to annex the rich provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. When the war began, the South German states, fearful of France, hastened to join Bismarck's North German Confederation, and so a united German nation without Austria came into being. On January 18, 1871, at Versailles, in the palace of France's former kings, Wilhelm I of Prussia, at the request of all the German princes, was proclaimed emperor of a united Germany. A new world power was born. 
But Germany, unlike its Western European neighbors, was a state still based on the power of king and army, rather than democratic assemblies. In the years to come, this would have its effects on the whole world. In January 1871, the unified nation for which so many Germans had struggled was finally proclaimed at Versailles. The new nation was, in fact, an empire ruled by the King of Prussia, now Emperor or Kaiser Wilhelm I. It included every German state except Austria. Within less than 50 years, this glittering empire was to fall apart, a casualty of World War One. A closer look at how it was run may provide clues to its failure. Within the new empire, Prussia was clearly dominant. Its king was now emperor, but other states were allowed to keep their kings and princes. Power in the empire resided in the royal castles and not in elected assemblies. There was an elected assembly in Prussia, the Landtag, but voting was rigged in favor of the aristocratic and land-owning classes to ensure a conservative majority and support for royal decisions. The new empire also had an elected assembly, the Reichstag. With deputies chosen on the more democratic basis of full adult male suffrage, but and this was crucial, neither the Landtag nor the Reichstag could compel government ministers to obey their decisions. Ministers were responsible only to the Kaiser. The system was created almost entirely by and for Otto von Bismarck, now Imperial Chancellor. To guarantee that power remained in the hands of the Prussian ruling class, deputies came to the Reichstag from many political parties. The conservatives and free conservatives represented the large landowners, the national liberals, big business, the left liberals, commercial and professional interests, the center party, the Roman Catholics, and the SPD or Social Democratic Party. The new industrial working class. Because these parties never had any real responsibility for government decisions, they developed more as political pressure groups than as responsible governing bodies. The center party, or Catholics, led by Ludwig Venthorst, worried Bismarck because he saw the church as a rival to the power of the state. Bismarck also feared the SPD or socialists who were trying to secure a better life for Germany's workers. Germany's rapid industrialization after 1850 had depended on keeping workers' wages low so that high profits could be used for capital investment. In good times, workers toiled long hours in unhealthy conditions, but they survived. In bad times. Starvation was rampant in the industrial cities. The SPD had been formally organized in 1869. It was based on the socialist ideal set out by Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto, first circulated in Europe at the time of the 1848 revolutions. Our ends can be obtained only by the forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions. Let the ruling classes tremble at a communist revolution. Bismarck did not so much tremble as pounce on those he saw as enemies of the state. First, the Catholics. Between 1871 and 1874, Catholic education was forbidden, and a number of priests were arrested. Between 1878 and 
SPD and trade union activity was outlawed, and members were arrested. Although the SPD was still allowed to run candidates for the Reichstag. Throughout the early years of the empire, Bismarck played one political party against another, suppressing those he could not convert to allies. Real power he kept for himself. In foreign affairs, he tried the same game, making and breaking alliances in an attempt to play Germany's rivals against each other. In 1879, however, Bismarck signed the Dual Alliance. Pledging Germany to assist Austria-Hungary, as the Austrian Empire was now known, against any threat of Russian expansion in the Balkans in southeastern Europe, this alliance was to lead Germany into World War One. In 1888, old Wilhelm I, seated in the carriage, died. His son and heir, Friedrich Wilhelm, on the brown horse, also died after only a few months on the throne. A grandson, Wilhelm II, on the white horse, became the new Kaiser. This cartoon called "Dropping the Pilot" is a comment on one of Wilhelm II's early acts. Eager to wield power directly, the new Kaiser forced Bismarck out of office and into retirement. Eight years later, Bismarck was dead, but his imprint lay everywhere in Germany and in Europe. Bismarck had boosted German power in Europe by using war as part of diplomacy. His less able successors were to use war in place of diplomacy, with disastrous results. Wilhelm II was one of these less able successors. When he came to the throne, he was a talented and energetic, but conceited and immature man of twenty-nine. One historian has written. Such a man on the throne might have been just tolerable if he had kept clear of public affairs. Wilhelm, on the contrary, proposed to rule as well as reign, and the constitution which Bismarck had given Germany permitted him to do so. Fond of heroic military poses, Wilhelm encouraged a tremendous upsurge of aggressive national feeling among the German people. Germany had become a nation very late, and national feeling had been pent up for a very long time. Now, at the end of the 19th century, it became a way of life. Clubs, youth groups, and cultural societies blossomed, all dedicated to glorifying German culture, German values, German history, and the German people. Soon, groups such as the Pan-German League were preaching the superiority of Germans and their culture. The trouble with schools, said the Kaiser in 1890, is that they stress learning at the expense of character building, and contaminate youth with socialist ideas. Soon, many schools were indoctrinating students in patriotism and punishing independent thinking. Grand symphonies, such as this one by Johannes Brahms, celebrate the German spirit. The poet Stefan Georga, extending Goethe's ideal of cultivating truth and morality within the individual, suggested that artists should not be bound by common standards of good and evil. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Raised even more profound questions about standards of good and evil, his ideas, often distorted or misinterpreted, provided the basis for many of the excesses of German nationalism and patriotism. Nietzsche despised middle-class German society and what he saw as its mealy-mouthed Christian values. He wrote of the need for a new man, a superman, a law unto himself. Who could fulfill mankind's dreams? As the spirit of nationalism, militarism, and mysticism raged through Germany, it withered the spirit of liberalism. Meanwhile, German industry continued its rapid advance, especially heavy industries turning out trains, ships, and weapons. 
the German army, pride of the new empire, was continuously strengthened. With the blessing of the Kaiser and a succession of weak chancellors, military men formed an alliance with industrialists that would influence and eventually dominate German policy. The first fruits of this alliance were seen after 1895 in an enormous build-up of the German navy. The Kaiser made his intentions clear. All the years of my reign, the monarchs of Europe have paid no attention to what I have to say. Soon, with my great navy to endorse my words, they will be more respectful. The build-up created serious tension between Germany and Great Britain. The British knew that the survival of their empire depended on naval superiority and they were determined to maintain it against all rivals. Further tension was created by Germany's desire to catch up with other European countries in acquiring colonies in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific. Kaiser Wilhelm said that Germany must have its place in the sun, but his aggressive actions and clumsy diplomacy were leaving Germany almost without allies and impelling other nations to prepare for war. To many people in Western Europe, Germany's system of government, still based on the divine right of kings, was dangerously outdated. But Chancellor Bettmann Hollweg defended it in a speech before the Reichstag. The concept of popular sovereignty is foreign to the Prussian constitution. Throughout the first decade of the 20th century, Germany and her European rivals frantically built up armaments. Diplomacy seemed less and less able to resolve recurring crises. In 1905, Germany deliberately provoked one such crisis by claiming rights in Morocco and then backing up the claim by sending the Kaiser there on a symbolic visit. At the Algeciras conference called to discuss the crisis, Germany's aggressive attitude, depicted in this cartoon as a German eagle attacking a French cock, drove France and Britain into a formal defensive alliance against Germany. Shortly afterward, Britain signed a similar alliance with Russia. Germany was becoming diplomatically isolated in Europe. In 1911, Germany provoked yet another crisis by sending the gunboat Panther to the Moroccan port of Agadir. Tension mounted throughout Europe. Germany had only one major ally left, Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary and Russia were competing for a number of provinces in the Balkans, provinces that had once been part of the Ottoman Empire. Austria-Hungary seemed bent on conflict with the Russian bear. Germany was pledged through Bismarck's dual alliance of 1879 to support Austria-Hungary. A general European war seemed... This atmosphere made for confusion and ferment in Germany's artistic life. The poet Johannes Becker wrote... We were possessed... In cafes, on the streets, in our studios, day and night, we were on the march at a cracking pace to fathom the unfathomable. Poets, painters, and musicians all working together to create the art of the century. German painters, like artists all over Europe, were looking at an age of industry and technology, nationalism and political upheaval, with a new kind of vision. As were composers such as Arnold Schoenberg. And writers such as the poet Jakob von Hoddes in a poem called End of the World. The storm is here. Crushed dams no longer hold. The savage seas come inland with a hop. The greater part of people have a cold. Off bridges everywhere, the railroads drop. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, 
was assassinated in the Balkans by a Serbian nationalist. Austria-Hungary reacted by presenting Serbia with an unacceptable ultimatum. Russia, the patron of the Serbs, mobilized. Germany, bound by Bismarck's dual alliance, also mobilized. The final lineup for the war looked like this. Fighting began on August 4th. In Germany, the proclamation of war was greeted with enthusiasm. Germany's great armies would crush all before them. Her national destiny, her divine desires, as Nietzsche had put it, would be fulfilled. In the Reichstag, all parties, including most of the socialist SPD, voted for war credits and approved the German invasion of neutral Belgium. The SPD vote was particularly important. Legalized again after 1890, the party by 1912 had become the largest in the Reichstag. However, its members were split. The larger faction, led by Edward Bernstein, believed in capitalism and in winning reforms through trade union activity and the ballot box. This faction enthusiastically supported the war. The other faction, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, still believed a workers' revolution was needed to sweep away the capitalist system. This faction resisted the moves toward war. Writer Thomas Mann sensed a sinister undercurrent among his fellow Germans. Germans know and despise the evil in themselves, and despise civilization because it hides that evil under hypocritical pretense, preventing its true expression. Germany had a plan to win the war, devised years earlier by Count Alfred von Schlieffen. In a two-front war, the whole of Germany must throw itself on one enemy, the strongest, most powerful, most dangerous enemy, and that can only be France. Schlieffen's plan was this. Part of the German army would launch a mass attack on France, wheeling through neutral Belgium and descending on Paris from the north. A diversionary German force would lead the French armies into a direct attack across the border, leaving the stronger German forces to mop up behind French lines. It was a brilliant plan, but it failed, due partly to unexpected Belgian resistance and partly to lack of nerve by the German general staff. Within a month, World War I had settled into the grim four-year stalemate of trench warfare. Military stalemate brought disillusionment in Germany. Where were the grand victories? Why was there only mud and death? In 1916, workers in German munitions factories went on strike. In February 1917, in a last desperate effort, the Germans launched a new weapon, unrestricted submarine warfare. One result was to bring the United States into the conflict. In October 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia brought a communist government to power. Early in 1918, the Russians withdrew their battered armies from what they saw as a capitalist war. Attracted by the ideals and examples of the Russian Revolution, the workers and peasants of Europe who were slogging it out in the trenches became increasingly demoralized. Russia's withdrawal ended the war in the East. In the spring of 1918, Germany launched its massed armies in a last great offensive on the Western Front. Horrifying casualties piled up on both sides, but the effort failed. American troops were now pouring into France, and in August 1918, the German line broke. Soon afterward, General Ludendorff and the general staff requested civilian politicians in the Reichstag 
to sue for peace. The Kaiser and his generals had lost the war. The politicians were now to pick up the pieces. At the beginning of November 1918, a mutiny broke out among German sailors at Kiel. It spread to soldiers in Hamburg. There were calls for a socialist revolution following the Russian example. On November 9th, with military defeat certain and the country in chaos, Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated and slipped quietly across the Dutch frontier into exile. The German Empire had collapsed. That same day, leaders of the Social Democratic Party proclaimed Germany a republic. Two days later, on November 11th, in a railway carriage near the French town of Compiègne, Germany signed the armistice ending World War I. What kind of Germany would rise from this defeat? August 1914, bands played and crowds cheered as the Imperial German Army set out to crush its enemies in the First World War. November 1918, the dream was over. Germany's armies were broken. Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated his throne and fled to the neutral Netherlands. Under a flag of truce, German representatives made their way through the front to a railway carriage in the forest of Compiègne, where they signed a humiliating armistice. Back in Berlin, crowds cheered as socialist leaders proclaimed a new democratic republic. Parliamentary government had come to Germany at last. At the same time, the threat of revolution was everywhere, with political groups of all kinds taking to the streets. Many left-wing groups, inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917, called for a similar solution in Germany, where widespread poverty and unemployment followed the return of soldiers from the front. In January 1919, a Marxist group known as the Spartacists, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, called a general strike and attempted a communist revolution in Berlin. In the South, in Bavaria, trade unionists and socialists set up an independent republic under the leadership of journalist Kurt Eisner, second from the left in this photograph. Elsewhere in Germany, revolutionary councils of workers and soldiers seized power locally. The social democratic politicians in control of the country were frightened by the idea of a workers' uprising, of a genuine socialist revolution. Their leader, Friedrich Ebert, made a secret deal with army generals. In exchange for allowing the army to operate independently of the government, Ebert got the army's agreement to crush the left-wing revolt. The generals did their job thoroughly. Karl Liebknecht, Rosa Luxemburg, and Kurt Eisner all died in a spasm of violence. On February 6th, the new National Assembly, or Reichstag, gathered in the provincial town of Weimar and immediately established a provisional government. The assembly had been chosen by the votes of all men and women over 20. The decision to meet at Weimar, the home of Goethe and Schiller, symbolized the assembly's humanitarian ideals and its hopes for a democratic future. Social Democrats were by far the largest party. But because the Social Democrats were split into factions, the majority socialist group was forced into coalition with Catholics and liberals to obtain a working majority. In May 1919, the Assembly moved from Weimar to Berlin and settled down to the business of government. First on the agenda was how to deal with the harsh terms of peace imposed by the victorious allies. The 
peacemakers who gathered at Versailles had widely different aims. British and French leaders, pressured by public opinion, sought to punish Germany heavily and to ensure that it could never again mount aggression in Europe. American President Woodrow Wilson, in his famous 14 points, had proposed a more lenient peace based on democratic principles. In the end, most of Wilson's points were modified or abandoned. To the despair of the Germans, who turned out in huge numbers to support a peace based on the 14 points. The final Treaty of Versailles, signed on June 28, 1919, placed heavy burdens on Germany. Thirteen percent of Germany's territory was ceded to France and to Poland. French and Allied troops occupied the heavily industrialized Saar region and the Rhineland. Severe restrictions were placed on German military strength and massive reparations were demanded. most resented was the clause placing total blame for the war on Germany. Most Germans felt betrayed, not just by the Allies, but also by their own government, which had no choice but to sign the treaty. To make matters worse, Germany was soon in the grip of a devastating inflation. The immediate cause was the massive borrowing that had financed the war. By 1919, the German mark was worth only 20% of its pre-war value. Recovery was hindered by the loss, under the terms of the Versailles Treaty, of territory that contained important industrial, mineral, and other resources. Large industrialists and landowners actually profited as the value of German currency plummeted. But those with fixed incomes or savings, mainly members of the middle class, were ruined. When the German government used the inflation crisis to avoid paying reparations to the Allies, French and Belgian troops occupied the industrial Ruhr. This brought on a total currency collapse. A billion mark note was soon worth less than a dollar. It took a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a dozen eggs. Germany was now full of people, ex-soldiers, ex-aristocrats, inflation victims, who thought that democracy and parliamentary government were responsible for all the country's ills. They even believed that the German army could have won the war, if Republican politicians hadn't stabbed it in the back by suing prematurely for peace. They flocked to join right-wing parties and societies, often financed by industrialists, landowners, and military men who clung to the old ideals of nationalism and militarism and who had nothing but contempt for the Republic and its leaders. As early as 1920, a right-wing civil servant named Wolfgang Kopp had organized an unsuccessful putsch or revolt against the government. His followers adopted the swastika as an emblem. Around the same time, an Austrian ex-corporal named Adolf Hitler was rising to the leadership of the German Workers' Party, a tiny right-wing group based in Bavaria. Their ideals were national pride and hatred of Jews and social democracy. Hitler proclaimed, I will know neither rest nor peace until the November criminals have been overthrown, until on the ruins of the wretched Germany of today there should have arisen once more a Germany of power and greatness, of freedom and splendor. On November 23, 1923, Hitler and his followers tried their own putsch against the Bavarian government. It fell apart in the face of resistance by the Bavarian police. Hitler served nine months here in Landsberg prison in a comfortable style that reflected official sympathy for his ideas. 
German culture in the early 1920s was marked by all the contradictions of post-war society. Hope for a new democratic age, despair at the horrors of war, and cynicism about the present. Germany's great novelist Thomas Mann wrote, I had found myself much more of a nationalist than I knew I was. Shattered, tormented, I threw myself into the fray. But, God knows, I will feel much easier when my soul, cleansed of politics, will again be able to observe life and humanity. Many painters and poets became part of a European movement called Dada, which rejected the kind of reason, logic, and order that had led to modern civilization. The painter Hans Arp wrote, "Reason uproots man and imposes on him a tragic existence. Our art is ordered according to the law of the accident, the incomprehensible order by which nature herself is governed." This is a healthy, natural art, which permits the stars of peace, love, and poetry to bloom in the hearts and heads of men. Many German dramatists in the 1920s passionately supported socialist causes, and their plays produced at left-wing theaters often involved political issues of the day. In Ivan Gol's 1922 satire *Methuselah*. A monkey proclaims an animal revolution. I call on you to start the animal revolution. We are chosen by God to cleanse the earth of human filth. Did ever a beast beat its breast in despair? Did ever a thrush want to blush? Did ever a creature need Nietzsche to teach her? Oh, man is the shame of the earth. In 1923, when Gustav Stresemann, leader of the mildly conservative German People's Party, became foreign minister and briefly chancellor, the years of post-war economic and political chaos in Germany came to an end. Stresemann was above all a practical politician. He felt that Germany could recover and re-expand only if political tensions at home and mistrust of Germany abroad. Could be lessened. In 1924, Stresemann went to Paris to negotiate with Allied representatives. The result was the Dawes Plan, which reduced reparations payments, provided for generous foreign loans, and recommended return of the Ruhr to Germany. The mark soon recovered its stability. But the effects of inflation remained, even though German industry experienced a boom. One British observer wrote, "Inflation has ruined the middle classes and impoverished the workers. It has undermined the political basis of the republic and concentrated all real power in the hands of a few, namely the great industrialists." Many of these industrialists continue to provide financial backing for the strident nationalism of Hitler and his growing party. Renamed the National Socialist German Workers, or Nazi Party. In elections in March 1924, the Social Democrats lost heavily, while conservative parties gained. For the first time, the Nazis won seats in the Reichstag. Popular support for nationalism over socialism. Was demonstrated in 1925 by the election of the aged war hero Field Marshal von Hindenburg as president. Meanwhile, Stresemann was continuing to win friends abroad. Treaties signed by Germany, France, and Belgium at Locarno in 1925 guaranteed existing frontiers and continued limitations on German armaments. In 1926. Stresemann secured Germany's membership in the League of Nations, a forerunner of today's United Nations. Two years later, Germany signed the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which renounced the use of war as an instrument of national policy. In other countries, 
the feeling against war was very strong. In England and France, many young people were taking a moral stand against war. In Germany, there was a darker side. While publicly dismantling its weapons in accordance with the Versailles Treaty, Germany was secretly and illegally rearming, with Stresemann's knowledge and approval. The sharp social and political divisions within Weimar society served as a theme for some German artists and writers. Operas by composers such as Paul Hindemith and Kurt Weill were often vehicles for social protest. But none expressed the spirit of Weimar, its sentimentality and its toughness, better than the Three Penny Opera, which Weill wrote in collaboration with the playwright Bertolt Brecht. The opera's villain, Mac the Knife, is simultaneously condemned as a capitalist exploiter and portrayed as a gallant adventurer. In most of Brecht's poems and plays in the 1920s, the old German ideal of individual achievement was replaced by the communist ideal of the greater good of the community. In his Song of the Rice Bargees, Brecht asks rich consumers to notice those who provide for them. When the rice reaches the town and the children ask who dragged the heavy barge, they're told it was just dragged. Pull faster, mouths are waiting for food. Pull together, don't jostle the man beside. The food from below comes to the feeders above. Those who haul it up, they have not. A group of artists, architects, and designers known as the Bauhaus flourished in Germany during the Weimar period and accounted for some of Europe's most outstanding artistic achievements. The basic Bauhaus concept was to unite art and modern technology. Criticism of Weimar society was forcefully expressed in the work of painters such as George Gross and Otto Dix and in the powerful visions of Kate Kollwitz. The European movement toward abstract art was influenced by the Russian painter Vasily Kandinsky and by the Swiss painter and poet Paul Klee, both of whom taught at the Bauhaus. Meanwhile, films such as Fritz Lang's Metropolis gave Germany an important place in the development of motion pictures. German stability came to an abrupt end in October 1929, the death of Gustav Stresemann on October 2nd, was followed closely by the stock market crash on Wall Street and a worldwide economic depression. In Germany as elsewhere, Banks failed, industrial production plunged, and unemployment soared, bringing suffering and hardship to many. German right-wing parties now began to flourish as never before, blaming parliamentary government, international communism, and Jewish financiers for the country's problems. Many people believed them. Adolf Hitler's Nazi party gained the most from Germany's economic collapse. Hitler was a spellbinding orator, and his speeches attacked the foundations of the shaky Weimar Republic. We must restore the self-respect of the German people. Our people must be educated consciously and systematically to fanatical nationalism. There is only one right in the world, and that right is one's own strength. But the Nazis did not rely solely on speeches to put their ideas across. Brown-shirted legions of thugs, known as the SA, or stormtroopers, threatened their opponents and sometimes savagely attacked them on the streets. Socialists, communists, and Jews were particular targets. The novelist Thomas Mann had always avoided taking sides in Germany's political arguments. But now, he wrote, 
Hitler has the great merit of producing a simplification of the emotions, of calling forth the holy, unequivocal no, a clear and deadly hatred. But for many Germans, Hitler did call forth a yes. In elections held in September 1930, the Nazis gained six million votes and 107 seats in the Reichstag, nearly one-sixth of the total. After the elections of 1930, only an economic miracle could have saved the Weimar Republic. There was no miracle. The lines of the unemployed lengthened. As the economic crisis deepened, Chancellor Heinrich Brüning, in a desperate attempt to cut government spending, slashed social services and unemployment benefits, just when people needed them most. Hardship increased dramatically. Again and again, in public speeches, Hitler promised an alternative, a glorious new German empire that would sweep away the enemies of the state. Nazi party membership more than doubled, reaching 900,000 by 1932. More than 600,000 of these were in the SA, the Nazis' private army. Meanwhile, the government was helping to undermine the democratic foundations of the republic. Under a special article of the Weimar Constitution, Brüning and his cabinet were now ruling by executive decree, bypassing elected representatives in the Reichstag. In April 1932, a very senile Hindenburg, now 84, was re-elected president of the Republic. With no party able to secure a Reichstag majority, Politicians, army generals, and industrialists maneuvered for position. All tried to manipulate Hindenburg, Hitler, and the Reichstag to their own ends. Even Hitler's industrial backers hoped to use his popularity without granting him real power. But Hitler told his associates, Now I have them in my pocket. They have recognized me as a partner in their negotiations. In elections held in 1932, the Nazis more than doubled their vote. They were now the largest party in the Reichstag. Months of plots and intrigues followed. Then, on January 30, 1933, Hitler was invited to form a new government as Chancellor. The Nazis moved quickly to ensure their control. Hitler called for new elections and conducted the campaign in a frenzy of anti-communist violence and propaganda. The communist threat that he cited seemed real on February 27th when the Reichstag building mysteriously burned. Hitler blamed the communists, but many historians now think the Nazis set the fire themselves. When elections were held, the Nazis polled only 44% of the vote. But Hitler, by refusing to allow communist deputies to take their seats, achieved the majority he needed in the Reichstag. By July 1934, all political parties except the Nazis had been outlawed. Hitler's new German empire, the Thousand-Year Reich, as he called it, had begun. There were many reasons why the Weimar Republic failed. This caricature suggests that the most powerful groups within German society did not support the Republic. For the army, the industrialists, the large landowners, and the well-to-do middle classes, democracy meant giving up some of their power. They were under no pressure to do so from the German people, who had no tradition or experience of democratic government. Political parties in the Reichstag tended to represent these established groups, not the nation as a whole. They could seldom agree or compromise, and so government was always by coalition, which weakened and divided the republic. 
added to this were the sense of resentment created by the Versailles Treaty and the suffering and chaos caused by inflation and depression. In times of trouble, Germans had always looked to strong leaders who spoke of national glory. In 1933, they did so once again. German people, hold your heads high and proudly once more. You are no longer enslaved and in bondage. You are free again and can justly say, we are proud that through God's powerful aid we have once more become true Germans. This was Hitler's message to the German people after he came to power on January 30th, 1933. Hitler claimed his new empire, or Reich, would last for a thousand years. The respectability of the new government was confirmed at an official day of national awakening on March 21st, attended by the aged President Hindenburg and members of the Reichstag. A French historian wrote, The doctrine of the totalitarian state as expounded by the Nazis at the beginning of 1933 satisfied the old bourgeoisie, the big industrialists, the great landowners, the bureaucrats, army officers, and university professors. With its emphasis on public works and housing programs, Nazi leadership also satisfied a large part of the working class. There was something for almost everybody. On March 23rd, Hitler achieved total power by persuading the Reichstag to pass an enabling law. It allowed Hitler to issue emergency decrees. In other words, to do anything he liked. Immediately, Hitler struck against the groups he hated most. Jews, socialists, and communists. Hundreds were publicly humiliated, tortured, beaten to death, hanged, shot or drowned. Within a few months after the Nazis came to power, thousands of opponents were in concentration camps, and all political parties except the Nazi party had been banned. The Nazis had used violence, mugging, and intimidation since the 1920s. Even so, Few Germans were prepared for the brutality with which the Nazis now sought to transform German society. One of the first laws the Nazis passed barred non-Jews from buying in Jewish-owned shops. Attacks on such shops were openly encouraged. Many German shopkeepers who had resented Jewish competition were pleased. Jews were forced to identify themselves publicly by wearing yellow badges. One by one, their civil and legal rights were taken away. Protestant and Catholic churches were also targets of Nazi persecution. As this protest poster points out, the only religion the Nazis wanted in Germany was their own fanatical nationalism. Public book burnings were organized where the works of Jewish and other un-German authors were destroyed, including German-born thinkers and writers such as Heinrich Heine, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, Bertolt Brecht, and Thomas Mann. Trade union halls were occupied by Nazi troops. Unions were dissolved, their funds confiscated, and their leaders arrested. Some were beaten and sent to concentration camps. The famous Bauhaus Academy was ordered closed. Almost all of Germany's leading writers, musicians, artists and scientists were driven abroad by the Nazis or voluntarily went into exile. The Nazis even turned against their own. Ernst Röhm, 
Standing on the left, head of the SA, the Nazi stormtroopers, displeased Hitler by proposing that the regular German army should also come under his control. Hitler knew that the army would turn against him if he took away its independence. So it was Rome who had to go. On June 30th, 1934, Units of the SS, an elite Nazi police force, murdered Rome and several hundred of his supporters, as well as other real or suspected opponents of Hitler, in a massacre that became known as the Night of the Long Knives. Having destroyed any effective opposition, the Nazis now began to create their own institutions to dominate every aspect of German life. With trade unions outlawed, all workers were forced to join a Nazi organization called the German Labor Front. Pay and conditions were dictated by the government. Workers could neither bargain nor strike. The Front also ran a recreational organization called Strength Through Joy, where work and social activities were combined with propaganda. Women were organized into the National Women's League. Mothers were rewarded for producing large families, especially sons, for future German armies. Young people, even children, were organized into Hitler youth groups where they were indoctrinated with Nazi ideas. But Hitler was shrewd enough to know that propaganda and strong-arm tactics would not keep the Nazis in power if they failed to solve Germany's desperate economic crisis. To bring down unemployment, the government built highways and public housing, a massive secret rearmament program breaking all the rules laid down by the Treaty of Versailles provided large numbers of industrial jobs. In 1935, a military draft took up still more idle manpower. Meanwhile, Dr. Halmar Schacht, Hitler's finance minister, skillfully manipulated Germany's currency to ensure that there would be no disastrous inflation. Six million people had been out of work when Hitler came to power in 1933. By 1935, the figure had dropped to two million. By 1939, there was actually a shortage of labor. As a result, the working class supported him. German society was completely transformed by Nazi rule. Yet despite propaganda, concentration camps and secret police, most people tried to believe that life was normal. The Nazis encouraged this belief. A Nazi poster read, Any idiot can rule with a truncheon. A far better way is to draw every comrade into cooperating with us. Bertolt Brecht saw the situation differently. What times are these when a conversation about trees is almost a crime? because it includes a silence about so many misdeeds. That one there, calmly crossing the street, hasn't he ceased to be at home to his friends in need? Hitler's Germany may have been the most extreme example, but it was not the only country after the horrors of World War I and a worldwide economic depression to embrace fascism as a solution to its domestic problems. Several years before Hitler rose to power, Benito Mussolini had introduced a one-party fascist dictatorship in Italy. In 1931, Japanese forces had invaded Chinese territory in Manchuria, the first aggressive act of a nationalistic military government. During the 1930s, pro-fascist dictators came to power in some states in Central Europe and the Balkans. In Spain, fascist-backed General Francisco Franco, aided by German and Italian arms, overthrew the legal Republican government in a bloody civil war. 
fascist movements emerged even in democratic countries such as Britain, France, and the United States. This is a swearing-in ceremony for a fascist recruit in London. The main opposition to fascism throughout the 1930s was provided by communist groups in various countries, and internationally by the Soviet Union. Most people in democratic countries were slow to see fascism as a threat. After World War I, many young people, especially in Britain, had become pacifists. No cause they felt was worth the horror and inhumanity of another war. Many people saw in international communism and in the Soviet Union, particularly, a threat greater than that posed by fascism and Nazi Germany. Many democratic leaders looked the other way, as Hitler spoke of breeding a new race of German supermen to rule the world, and fostered hatred of Jews who were being persecuted, imprisoned, tortured, and killed by the Nazis. Winston Churchill, then a member of the British Parliament, was a lonely voice warning of the devastation that fascism would bring to Europe. In the 1970s. Albert Speer, a former Nazi official, wrote, "Had Hitler announced before 1933 that he would burn down Jewish synagogues, involve Germany in a war, and kill Jews and political opponents, he would, at one blow, have lost me and probably most of the supporters he won after 1930." Maybe so. Most Germans at the time found it was easier and safer to keep silent. Hitler's greatest ambition was to carve out a new German empire, reclaiming all the territory lost at Versailles and incorporating those areas of Europe that had German-speaking populations or had once been ruled by Germans. Hitler's goal was the old 19th-century dream of a greater Germany, encompassing all of Austria and parts of France. Switzerland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and Poland. As early as October 1933, Hitler withdrew Germany from the League of Nations, and then from the Geneva Disarmament Conference. German rearmament accelerated, and a military draft was started in 1935. Although these acts were illegal according to the Versailles Treaty. Britain, France, and Italy merely protested. They took no action. Encouraged, Hitler made his first move to grab territory, sending German troops to reoccupy the Rhineland early in 1936. It was a gamble because Britain and France could easily have stopped him. Again, they did nothing. Writing from exile, Thomas Mann declared that Germany was now. Loved by none, watched with dread and cold dislike by all. The fascist tide was rising. In 1935, Mussolini's Italian troops had attacked the African state of Abyssinia, now known as Ethiopia. Abyssinian Emperor Haile Selassie protested to the League of Nations. But Abyssinia was annexed to Italy in 1936. The League, created to deter just this kind of aggression, was powerless. In the Spanish Civil War, which began in the summer of 1936, both Germany and Italy provided direct aid to the fascist side. The German Air Force tried out new tactics in Spain, including saturation bombing of civilian areas. The democratic nations refused to provide aid to Spain's legal republican government or to republican war refugees. The Soviet Union was the only nation to support the Spanish Republic. By 1938, Hitler was ready to begin expansion in Europe. Although political union between Germany and Austria was forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles, German forces occupied Austria in March 1938. And Austria was incorporated into the German Reich. With all of Europe thoroughly alarmed, Hitler now threatened Czechoslovakia, 
claiming that three million Germans living in the Sudetenland were being mistreated. Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, hoped to prevent war by giving in to Hitler's demands, a policy known as appeasement. Though scorned today, appeasement seemed to many people at the time a morally correct way of undoing the wrongs done at Versailles. Many also believed that appeasement was preferable to war. Chamberlain certainly believed that Hitler wanted only to reverse the wrongs of Versailles. I form the opinion that Herr Hitler's objectives are strictly limited. The impression left on me was that Herr Hitler meant what he said. At the Munich conference in September 1938, Chamberlain and French Prime Minister Daladier agreed that Hitler could take over the Sudetenland. Czech Prime Minister Benesch was not even invited to the conference. Chamberlain returned to England, claiming that this agreement would produce peace for our time. Six months later, Hitler took over all of Czechoslovakia. Next on Hitler's list was Poland. The Treaty of Versailles had given Poland this corridor to the sea, cutting off East Prussia from the rest of Germany. Hitler threatened war to get it back. At last, Britain and France realized that Hitler could only be stopped by force. They pledged themselves to support Poland and tried to persuade the Soviet Union to join them. Meanwhile, they stepped up their own rearmament. Suddenly in August 1939, the world was stunned to learn that Germany and the Soviet Union, those bitterest of enemies, had signed a mutual non-aggression pact. To Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, the pact was a way of buying time, of postponing war with Germany, while the Soviets built up their own forces. To Hitler, the pact ensured that Germany would not have to fight a war on its eastern and western fronts at the same time. Poland has always had the secret intention of exploiting every opportunity to do us harm, there is therefore no question of sparing Poland. We must prepare ourselves for the conflict. In the early morning hours of September 1st, 1939, the German army swept into Poland. Within two weeks, the ill-equipped Polish army had been destroyed. Six months of inactivity along Germany's frontier with France, known as the Phony War, were followed by another massive German advance in the West with planes, tanks, and infantry. Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, and Belgium fell quickly, and the Germans poured into France, encircling French and British troops. Between May 27th and June 4th, 340,000 British soldiers were evacuated by sea from the Channel port of Dunkirk. On June 13th, German troops paraded through Paris. On June 21st, France surrendered in the same railway car at Compiègne where the Germans had admitted defeat after World War I. The ground war in the West was over, and Hitler had won. Only Britain held out, despite massive bombing of British cities by the German Air Force. The German armed forces must be prepared to crush Soviet Russia in a quick campaign before the end of the war against England. In June 1941, Hitler sent his armies eastward to invade the Soviet Union. It was his first major military mistake. At first, the Germans advanced swiftly, but then the Russian winter set in. German troops were ill-equipped for it and their supply lines were overextended. The Russians, who had suffered terrible losses, counterattacked. By January 1943, the German army in Russia was beaten. It was the turning point of the war. As defeat became a possibility, murder and terror mounted in Germany and in the countries occupied by the Nazis. No one was safe from the SS and the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police. The Jews of Europe suffered most, 
as the SS carried out Hitler's final solution to the Jewish problem. Jews were rounded up in vast numbers. More than six million were exterminated in concentration camps. When British and American troops landed at Normandy on June 6, 1944, Germany's military position was already hopeless. Toward the end, desperate German officers were throwing 12 and 14-year-old boys into battle. German cities were reduced to rubble by Allied saturation bombing. Over 200,000 lives were lost during a three-day bombardment of Dresden. An eyewitness described Hitler in those final days. His left arm hung slackly, and his hand trembled a good deal. There was an indescribable flickering glow in his eyes, creating a fearsome effect. All his movements were those of a very old man. Allied armies advanced relentlessly towards Berlin. On April 30th, 1945... Hitler committed suicide in this concrete air raid bunker. On May 7th, the German army surrendered. The thousand-year Reich had ceased to exist. In the epilogue to a Brecht play about the rise of Hitler, the audience is told, Therefore learn how to see and not to gape, to act instead of talking all day long. The world was almost won by such an ape. The nations put him where his kind belong, but don't rejoice too soon at your escape. The womb he crawled from still is going strong.